Okay, so welcome to the next interview for AATRN, the Applied Algebraic Topology Research Network. Applied Topology is a research area with a strong sense of community, and AATRN has been working hard to try and keep it that way during the pandemic. So thank you to all of you for joining. So within our community, we have a lot of knowledge, not only about research, but also about professional development. And the goal of this interview series is to hear, learn from, and celebrate our community's stories. Okay, so I'm now going to introduce the interviewer. <clears throat> so our interviewer today is, the person asking the questions is Professor Omar Bobrovsky. So Professor Bobrovsky received his uh, doctorate at the Technion, advised by Dr. Adler, and is currently an assistant professor professor at the Vitebi Faculty of Elect Electrical Engineering at the Technia. His research expertise is in applied and random topology, as well as probability and stochastic processes more generally. He is particularly well known for his work on random simplicial complexes, the topology of noise, and statistical aspects of TDA. Thank you, Professor Borowski, for hosting our interview today. Uh, thank you, Hanan, for the introduction. Uh, no, just making us louder. Oh, okay. Well, uh, yeah, so let me introduce uh, Robert. Uh, so Robert is a professor emeritus now in the <laughs> Faculty of Electrical and Computer Engineering. Uh, he is a world-renowned pro probabilist and uh, one of the leading figures behind uh, making random topology one of the key areas today in, in applied topology. Uh, he got his uh, bachelor's degree in mathematical statistics uh, from the University of Sydney in uh, 1971. Uh, in 1972, he received his master's degree in uh, mathematics from the Australian National University. And in 1975, he received his PhD in mathematics from the University of New South Wales. A uh, few years after, he moved from Australia to Israel and he joined the Technion uh, to the Industrial Engineer Engineering Department, uh, where he stayed more or less uh, for roughly uh, almost 30 years. Uh, between 1996 and 1999, he moved to uh, UNC Chapel Hill, uh, where he had a position in the Department of Statistics, uh, went back to the Technion, and then in 2008, he slowly started moving from the Industrial, industrial Engineering Department to the Electrical Engineering Department. Uh, and there he was until uh, in 2018, he retired, but as he said, not expired. Um, <clears throat> so uh, Robert, uh, throughout his career, received many honors and prizes. Uh, when I asked him uh, as a preparation for the interview, uh, what should be the top three honors that I should mention? Um, then he, he said a father, a grandfather and a great grandfather. And he said that uh, anything other than that can be, uh, people can see in my CV. Uh, so I should say that Robert has two daughters, uh, six grandchildren, and uh, recently he had his first uh, great grandson, uh, <clears throat> something that he's very excited by. Uh, a little bit of an, of an, of an of overview on his research. So he wrote several books uh, uh, in probability theory, mainly focused on uh, Gaussian random fields. Uh, actually, his first book uh, called The Geometry of Random Fields from 1981 uh, was recently republished by Siam in the series of classics in applied mathematics. He was the chief editor of uh, Stochastic Processes and Application and uh, Annals of Applied Probability, two of the leading uh, journals in probability, and he was also serving on the ed editorial board of uh, more or less all the important probability journals. And currently is on the scientific board of the Journal of Applied and Computational Anthropology. Um, in 2009, he was one of the organizers of an AIM uh, meeting the uh, American Institute of Mathematics in Palo Alto back then. Uh, the meeting was titled The Topological Complexity of Random Sets. And this is one of the key events, or maybe the first one where uh, actually TDA people and probability statistics people met together in an organized way. And, many of the ideas and the research direction that are being studied today uh, in some extent uh, started there or were conceived there. Um, the main research interest that Robert had throughout his career uh, was Gaussian processes and uh, specifically Gaussian random fields. Uh, one of his major uh, main results uh, is related to the Euler characteristic and the extrema of uh, Gaussian fields. 
And this is a very remarkable example for two things. First of all, it's a pretty remarkable theory bringing together uh, probability theory, Riemannian geometry, even some topology uh, put together to get a very deep and fascinating theory. But moreover, uh, this theory actually found real world application that have been used, uh, for example, in brain imaging, cosmology, and oceanography, and I think recently even more areas. Uh, so it's a really nice uh, um, combination of really deep and complicated theory that can be uh, actually used in the real world. Uh, okay, so I think I'll be done with the introduction and uh, uh, welcome Robert now and uh, start the questions. Um, so uh, you retired something like three years ago. Uh, how is that working out for you? Three years, 20 days, 19 days, <laughs> and uh, 18 hours is wonderful. I recommend retirement to everybody. Just don't wait until you're 68. You should retire from 30 to 50, and then at 50, come back to work. But it's wonderful. Um, yeah, yeah, you learn very quickly to be able to say, no, no, I can't do that anymore, I'm retired, you know. Um, no arguments with deans, you know. Most of the time they try to avoid you anyway. Uh, so it's worked out very well. Okay. Um... Maybe that, uh, so I quickly reviewed your, your uh, academic path, but maybe uh, you can tell us more about both your, the trajectory of your academic career and the geographic uh, trajectory of you moving from one place to another. Mm -hmm. Well, I, uh, first of all, I should thank the organizers, right? You yeah, always thank the organizers. Uh, <laughs> so I, I really want to thank the organizers for giving this opportunity to spend time talking about my favorite subject, me. Um, okay, so I, I was born in a little mining town called Newcastle um, in Australia, about a hundred miles north of Sydney. When I was age five or six, we moved to the outskirts of Sydney. I grew up there, um, in a sort of a migrant uh, area. Um, as they, they used to say about New Yorkers, you know, kids in my school were so tough, you know, they stole hubcaps off moving cars. Um, but it was not a, a highly academic area. Uh, but I managed to get out of it. I got, got to university, uh, Sydney University. Um, I had no idea what I wanted to study. I mean, I'm a bit embarrassed to say this because I, I watched some of the other interviews, you know, distinguished mathematicians who knew at age three, you know, they wanted to do mathematics. I got to university, I had no idea what I wanted to study. So the system in Australia in those days, you did four subjects. Your first year, three in your second year, two in your third year. And if you remain for the honours year, right, which was uh, not compulsory, you did one subject. So the first year I did math because obviously you did math. Right? I did physics because I, I thought it was interesting. I did psychology because I had no idea what it was. And I did economics just in case I wanted to be a businessman. And then I had to drop a subject. And so for the third year, I dropped economics since I almost failed it. I kept psychology because it was the most interesting of all the subjects. And the male female ratio was very different to the other subjects. I, uh, I kept up in mathematics because obviously you kept up in mathematics. And then I, I needed another subject and I, I couldn't, I dropped, I couldn't do physics. It was too hard. So I wasn't going to take that for another year. Um, I solved that problem by marrying a physicist um, afterwards. But, and then I did statistics because it was just another math subject. Uh, and, and during that period, I fell in love with probability. And I fell in love with probability not, I think, because it was probability, but because I had an absolutely brilliant teacher of probability. There's a man called Jeff Eagleson, and Jeff was a, me a mediocre probabilist, but he was a brilliant teacher who loved the subject. And so that university actually turned out a number of people who then went on to careers in probability or mathematical statistics. I mean, Peter Hall is, is probably the most famous. 
because of one very gifted, uh, very dedicated teacher. And then, you know, so then I, I, I could tell you about my PhD. I started in one university, um, with an elderly professor in the English style who told me, this is what you have to work on. I didn't like it, so I went to another university. Um, and there I had a supervisor by the name of Michael Hassifer, a fascinating character. He was an Egyptian Jew. His first degree was in civil engineering from Farouk University. And he found his way to Australia. And he'd done a PhD with Pittman. So those of you who know Jim Pittman, who is a very a leading probabilist in Berkeley, um, his father was a leading statistician in Australia. And uh, and Hassifer had this, Michael Hassifer had this problem, uh, statistical engineering problem. And, uh, he, he wanted to understand the structure, uh, since he was a civil engineer, of loads on earth underneath structures. And he came back from his sabbatical and he said, look, I went to a seminar on Gaussian processes by Dick Dudley. I, I got the, I didn't understand the seminar, but I got his paper, read this, it was 60 pages long. And he said, then I heard another seminar the next week um, by a French integral geometer called Jean-Pierre Seller on integral geometry. I didn't really understand it, but I got a copy of his paper. He said, why don't you, I think the two might somehow be related. You know, why don't you write a thesis about it? And that was it. You know, like that was an absolutely brilliant idea. It taught me all about how to do PhD supervision, right? You, you take a student and you just throw an idea at him and then you go away and let him do his thing. Uh, usually what comes out of it is something completely different to what you thought of. But, you know, a good student will always take uh, an idea, a half-baked idea, turn it, twist it, and get something, you know, new and interesting out of it. Um, a bad student will fail, but you know, bad student shouldn't be doing a PhD anyway, probably. So, yeah, so I think it's a good system. All right, so that, that's, and yes, then I came to Israel in 1980, um, and the rest is history. Right, next question. Uh, so you, I guess you would consider yourself a mathematician. Mm -hmm. What are you doing in a, so this is the question I also get quite a lot by students and uh, other colleagues. What are you doing in an electrical engineering department? Well, you know, it's all, it's all a question of who considers me a mathematician. To quote my good friend Schmuel Weinberger, please face the screen, stop <laughs> looking at the, what it is you're doing while I'm talking. Um, you know, Schmuel once said that, uh, he used to, he, as we walked down the hallowed halls of University of Chicago math department, you know, he can almost hear his colleagues saying behind his back, I don't know, that Weinberger used to be such a good mathematician, but look who he's mixing with now. And if those are more or less your words. Um, yeah, I'm a mathematician because I'm not an engineer. Um, I guess I'm an applied mathematician. Um, most of what I do is theory, but it's motivated by applications. And from the very first day of my PhD, it was motivated by questions of a, of a civil engineer. Uh, I like applications. I like the kind of mathematics they lead to. Um, you know, again, over the years, I look back at conferences that I went to and I've been to you know, as a speaker, as an invited speaker, um, conferences on physical oceanography, conferences on uh, medical imaging, um, you know, or, or, and other areas that I knew nothing about, conferences on applied topology, right, that I knew nothing about, right? I think that's one of your next questions, how did I get into applied topology? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, right. But you already answering most of the I'm questions. I'm answering questions as yeah. we go along, right? Whatever. Omar uh, knows me. You know, he knew he knew what he was saying when he said, you know, he'll just let me talk. Yeah. Um, my, my children said, what, they're only giving you an hour? 
Um, yeah, yeah. So, so how do I get into applied topology, for example? Um, well, I was writing this book with Jonathan Taylor from Stanford um, on random fields. And while doing this, I needed some result about um, stratified manifolds. And there are only two books that really dealt with stratified manifolds. One was Goretzky and McPherson, if I remember correctly. And the other one was by some guy called Weinberger. And I had no idea who any of these people were, but while I was working on this, a seminar notice came in that this guy Weinberger was giving a talk in the math department. Um, so I found out what room he was sitting in. I called him up and said, listen, you don't know me. I don't know you, but I have a question about, you know, intersections of, uh, of stratified manifolds. He said, you know, come over. I came over. I asked him my question. And you know the old joke when you ask a New York, New York Jew a question, he answers with a question. So I asked him my question and he said, why do you want to know? So I started telling him why I wanted to know. I, I don't think to this day he ever answered my question. Um, and I solved the problem in the book by saying it is easy to see that. Um, but uh, one thing led to another and we started talking about topology and probability and probability and topology. Uh, and that led to this uh, AIM conference uh, on probability and topology. And around about the same time, I, I was invited to APMCS. Um, I had no idea why. I actually still don't really know why, since um, I, I didn't know nothing about applied topology. Um, the only topology I knew was Betty numbers. Um, I knew basically what homology was. Uh, I had no idea what cohomology was. I still don't. But uh, as Herbert Edelstein once said to me, oh, no, you, you don't need to know about cohomology. Now, I don't think that was a generic you, you know, that nobody needs to know about. Co it was me, I, Robert Adler, doesn't need to about, know about cohomology. Well, I'm not sure that was a great compliment, but, you know, I'm sure he was right. Um, so I went to this conference and, and I sat there for two and a half days, um, listening to talks, some more theoretical, some uh, computational and some data analytic. And you know, they were good talks. I could understand what was going on without knowing the details, but there was something that was bothering me you know, through two and a half days of, of, of conference. And I couldn't put my finger on it. There was something that, were, that I, I just didn't like in the data analysis. And that I still don't like in a lot of TDA analysis. And then um, Wednesday morning, I gave my talk. And you know, I'm halfway through the talk. And I, I get to a point that We've all got to, you know, we're talking, there are 100, 200, whatever it was, people out there. And nobody understands a word you're saying. And you can see it on their faces, like nothing is getting across. Um, so normally you just keep going, but me being me, I didn't, I stopped. And I thought, you know, I, I don't understand why nobody understands. Because what I'm saying is really simple uh, at this particular moment. And it wasn't simple because, you know, some things are simple because you've been doing them for 20 years. And so you think of them as obvious. This really was something very simple in probability. And then it hit and I look out to the audience and I said, tell me how, how many people here have done a course in statistics? Zilch, nobody. I mean, maybe there were a couple, but they were scared to put up their hands in a topological you know, audience. All right, who here has done a course in probability? And so I got a couple of measure theory. I did measure theory. So that's not probability. You know, who has really done probability? And there were a handful of people who'd done the first course in probability. And then they hit me what was wrong, you know, with TDA. 
people were doing analysis of data without any, any reference to the fact that data was random. That if you did an experiment one day and you did it the next day, you'd almost always get different results. And you could take the results and you could create uh, persistence diagrams or whatever it is you were computing. And one day they'd be different from what you measured the next day because of measurement error, because of you're measuring something on different people or, you know, different objects. Uh, and one had to somehow mix statistics and, uh, and, and TDA or the, just the applied topology. I remember when Robert Christ is out there. Anyway, Robert strongly disagreeing with me. Robert's attitude was the attitude, well, you know, if you if there's statistical variation in your data, you should just do your experiment more carefully, which is an old physics way of, of responding to statistical analysis. But that led me to the belief that, you know, somehow statistics, probability, TDA, you know, all had to be mixed up together. Um, one thing led to the other. And, uh, and here we are, able to not. I'm being interviewed on an applied topology um, network. Amazing. Over the course of 12 years, you feel that these things have been changed significantly? They've changed significantly. They've changed significantly. Uh, first of all, one certainly sees in the pure TDA side of things, there's a lot more statistical analysis than, than what there was there. Um, some statisticians, not enough, but some statisticians have got involved. Um, and that's important because for applied topology, you don't want applied topologists to have to do, learn, you know, invent once again the new, new statistics. There's a lot of stuff out there that is immediately and easily applicable to persistence diagrams, say. Eh? Uh, so certainly there's, there's a lot more statistical analysis now going on together with the, with the, the topology. And of course, there's a statistical, there's stochastic topology, which is more theoretical. And the thing that you do, you know, a bunch of people are now doing. I mean, in, in, in some ways it started, I think, with Matt Kale. But Matt was more, you know, a topologist was just adding a little bit of probability. And his interest to see what happened when you added probability to topology. Um, whereas my interest would be much more what happens when you add topology to probability. Um, what has changed a lot in the last 12 years, we say, such a short time. Um, yeah, it's all relative. Um, 12 years is nothing. That's a horrible thought. 12 years, I'll be 83. Good God. Um, now, 12 years is a long time. Uh, where was I? Yes. So 12 years ago, for example, in, this, in random topology, it was actually very hard to publish things because you would send these papers to probability journals and they would say, I mean, the, the most extreme review, I think, where that I ever saw from a good journal, which I don't want to name because, you know, I, I, re I really respect the annals of probability. And so I don't want to, you know, deride it. But they, the editor, associate editor, I remember at the time wrote, well, we can't publish this because the topology is too difficult for our readers. Like, you know, hey guys, there's something new out there. So, uh, maybe you want your readers to learn something uh, rather than going over and over the same stuff. Um, and it was not that different than the topology journals. Uh, the topology journals, you know, could handle simple probability, you know, but the same thing when it became more sophisticated, it was, well, you know, it's not for our readers. And besides the probability, which is a bit applied and a bit dirty, so, you know, we don't want it in our journals. That's changed. Um, one of the, the things that changed that, but that's a cheat, 
in some ways is the creation of the Journal of Applied and Computational Topology. So now there really is a journal there that is designed for you know for all you people out there in TDA land I mean and the theoretical side of TDA land. Um, so there's a natural venue for these kinds of papers but we also want to see the more classical journals um, you know accepting uh, things like this and uh, it, it's changed I, I remember when we did the AIM meeting with so the, the organizers as you said before I was an organizer but Shmuel Weinberger was an organizer and Steve Seldich was an organizer and I remember at the end of the AIM meeting we sat together with the AIM people and Shmuel and I were a little you know unhappy because it was true we've got these things together but there was somehow not a lot of depth in it and I remember I can't remember his name but the, the head of AIM at the time said, well, you know, what do you expect? You've got these two huge subjects. You know, one is topology, one is probability. We said, let's consider them as convex sets. You know, when you bring them together, they're going to meet at the boundary. You know, and it's going to be a while until they merge. And so you're not going to have depth at the beginning. You know, now, 12 years later, you know, we're past the boundaries and, and there's a lot more depth and the subject has got life of its own, which is neat. Okay. Uh, question number three. <laughs> no, we're moving randomly through the questions because oh, you're answering most of them in advance. Uh -huh. uh, but uh, relating to what you said before about past two reviews and a lot of things that happened both in probability and statistics and topology. Uh, one thing that seems to have not developed so much is actually your sort of main passion throughout the career, which is the Gaussian fields. Uh, so so in, in my PhD, the, the goal was to start studying that and see what we can say about the topology of Gaussian fields. I didn't help, I wasn't very useful in that respect. Um, and since then, I think there have been some development, but not so many. I mean, it's, it's sort of left behind. And, or are you disappointed or what do you think? Why do you think is that or what do you think can be done? Or, well, first of all, first of all, you're characteristically wrong in underplaying your early results on Gaussian fields and topology because they were really nice. However, I agree, they led nowhere, yeah. right? Um, and so the thing is, you know, let's take the easiest of all problems, you know, so this is not an audience out there that probably knows much about Gaussian random fields. But a Gaussian random field, it's just, it's a random surface, right? Um, and, and the sort of questions you ask is if you cut off this surface at some point, right? And so you look at, at level, not at level sets, at excursion sets. You look at the regions above some level, right? So what can you say about the topology of these regions? Now, it turns out you can say a lot or quite a lot about their, their geometry. Their, their size, their surface area, cross-sectional values, these sort of measures that come up in integral geometry. So there you can say quite a bit. It also turns out that for an n-dimensional object, there are n plus one integral geometric measures, right, um, in integral geometry. The bigger, it's the volume of an object, the surface area of the object, sort of, one an average one-dimensional cross-sectional length an average two-dimensional cross-section areas things of, of that nature the n plus first one of these or the zeroth one depending whether you count it in australia or, or the hemisphere the, the the other extreme from the volume is the euler characteristic so so this is interesting because there the euler characteristic is not a topological thing or it is a topological thing, but it comes up as one of a class of geometric things. And if you want to understand distribution of the Euler characteristic of these sets, there's a tool, and the tool is Morse theory. And why does Morse theory work for probabilists? Because Morse theory is you know, about critical points. Critical points is about what happens locally in a random object. 
And probability is all about local, right? If I have if I have a function, probability tells me what's the distribution at one point. What's the distribution, joint distribution at two points? What's the joint distribution at three points? And you can generalize from there. What probability has a lot of trouble telling you about is what's the distribution of all the points together. And if you want to know topology, right? If you want to know Betty numbers, for example, right? You have to know, it's not enough to know how many critical points you have of what index, right? You have to know whether a critical point of some index you know, creates some homology or destroys homology. And for that, it's not enough to know what's happening locally. You have to know what's happening everywhere. And it's very hard, almost impossible for probabilistic tools to get to that. And so, so it's a disappointment. Um, I remember the very first time I met Gunnar Carlson, and I think I think it was at this uh, first ATMCS meeting. Um, Gunnar said, "Oh, you know, we, we knew a little bit of one another's existence." Mm. Um, but I think after my talk, he said, "Oh, great! If you can do these distributions of Euler characteristics, you can tell us something about Betty numbers." And my attitude was great. You know, I just heard about these Betty numbers. I can do Euler characteristics. I can do Betty numbers. But but no, no, you you can't turn the topology of Betty numbers into something local. And probability can only handle local. On the other hand, there's always another hand. On the other hand, because the question is important, there's been a lot of numerical work. A lot of numerical work. Um, most of it in the, I mean, some of, most of it in, in the, the cosmological literature. So Pratyush, I don't know if Pratyush is here, I don't think so. Uh, Pratyush Pranav, who was a postdoc here, but it's basically, is, not basically, is a cosmologist and, and other cosmologists have done a lot of numerical work to find out, uh, yeah. So there aren't formulas, there aren't exact distributions, but the uh, numerical answers and when all is said and done, that, that gives you an answer too. Do you it's think, over to you. Do you think it should it sort of hit a dead end or you think uh, it's just waiting for some breakthrough? I, I don't know. Um, at the moment, it's a dead end. Um, and the break give it again to another PhD student. To I wouldn't give it another PhD student. First, I, you know, I, I'm not that uh, cool. <laughs> um, no, I, 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 I think it's a problem. Who was it? Um, Feynman. Feynman used to say that uh, <clears throat> you should keep ten problems in your head at any given time. And so I let them sort of ferment there and then ever so often, you know, solutions will pop up. So there aren't many Feynman's around. Um, but if the community keeps this problem in its head, right, or the communities, because it's more than one community, then, you know, maybe a bit of a solution will pop up here and another one there and, and we'll get something. But I don't think it's something that you one should, can sit down and, and just work on. Uh, anything actually this is not a question that i prepared before but any anything interesting you've been working on thinking on really recently well i've been seriously working on avoiding changing diapers for great grandsons that's, uh, i think that's you know, um no 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 i uh, i'm enjoying retirement Enjoying retirement. So, you know, I, I talk to people, I work a bit with people, you know. Um, but I have time, you know, having written N books over the years, uh, there are always people writing uh, with questions like, uh, I don't understand line three on page 57, you know. Um, and so most of the time the answer is, well, that's because line three is wrong. You know? 
I made a mistake. Um, but, you know, sometimes there are good questions and over the years you just fob these off, you know, because who has time? Um, nowadays, I actually spend time answering these sorts of questions, saying, uh, you know, answering the question and then asking my own, which is a la Shmuel, you know, which is, why do you want to know? Because most of the people who write these questions are not mathematicians. And so it's always interesting to know why you know, they want to know. But I, I don't have any large projects or anything that I'm working on. Okay. I mean, nobody's paying for them anymore. Why should I? All right. Maybe last question for this more serious, uh, more serious. part. Uh, so, so you mentioned earlier, uh, what, what, what were the issues 12 years ago with respect to probability statistic TDA? Uh, so as, as a someone who sort of nowadays uh, still a senior probabilist and also a leading figure in the TDA community, any message or something you want to convey to, to either of these communities, uh, probability versus TDA? No, I, I part, you know, um, <laughs> this department has a very, very famous, has, I mean, it's not young anymore, very, very famous information theorist, winner of the equivalent of Nobel Prizes in, in electrical engineering. And he did one of these interviews somewhere and somebody said to him, you know, what uh, directions do you think, you know, the subject should be going in? And his response was, well, don't ask me, I'm, I'm 80, you know, I'll ask the 30 year olds, um, you know, I can tell you about what was, I can't tell you what, what will be. Um, and, and so, Overall, if I look at TDA, right, and, and this is very much as an outsider, um, I think, uh, and I, I maybe I'm wrong here, but I still get the impression that a big challenge for TDA is computational. Right? That until you know, TDA algorithms and approaches you know, work at the level where you can pick up your phone and you know, on the spot it does some analysis based on topological data. You know, um, it, it's not going to catch on. It's, it's not like the old days where people were prepared to wait an hour or two for results. Um, so I, I think, although I know nothing about you know computations, um, you know, I, as you know, uh, having been a student of mine, um, I, I program in GS. Right? So for those of you who don't know, GS is a phenomenal programming language that has stood the test of time. Um, it's short for graduate student. Um, but the thing about GS is that every three, four years, you, it gets updated to a new system. No, with absolutely no effort on, on your part. Um, it, it just works, you know, and you don't need to learn anything new. Um, but I, I think that's, that's a challenge. From the probabilistic point of view, um, we, you know, we being everybody, um, I've done a lot of analysis and a lot of detailed analysis now of many kinds of random structures. There are random structures out there in statistical mechanics, particularly, um, that people have studied for decades. Um, the physicists know that there's topological stuff going on. Um, they've never really been able to handle it, uh, even, even with physicists' mathematics. Because right, they, they don't have most of them the topological uh, you know, tools. And I'm thinking specifically statistical mechanics. I'm not thinking, for example, um, things like string theory, quantum mechanics, and so on. Their topology has played quite a role. Uh, but statistical mechanics, which of its nature probabilistic, I think is a wide open area for, uh, for stochastic topology. Okay, so uh, let's uh, move on to the more entertaining part. The entertaining um, part. Uh, yeah, so what... <laughs> it's been boring until now, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm doing my best. I don't know. Yeah. Well, we're waiting for the comedy. 
so what, what would you consider as, a, well, I don't know, maybe this is still a serious question. The next one I know, but anyway, what would you consider as the most, uh, as the highlight of your career or the moment achievement you're most proud of? Yeah, the achievement I'm most proud of? Oh, that's simple. My students, my students. So over the year, I've been very lucky, right? really. Um, and over the years, I've had some truly outstanding students, but you know, not just the most recent one. Um, you know, as far back as, I guess the first one was Gennady Smorodinsky, um, and that was back in the 80s. Um, and, and part of the reason for this, I guess, is because when you meet students the first time and you teach them, they always like to be entertained. Um, but part of it is, I think the main thing is because I was not in a math department. So you asked before, you know, I never answered, you know, what was I doing in engineering departments? So at the Tech now, I've always been in engineering. Um, when I go on sabbaticals and visit people, they're in stat departments or in math departments or in CS or so on. Uh, but mainly stat with a heavy probabilistic content or, or math, as long as there are probabilists or shmuel there. Um, and, but when I came to the Technion, um, probability was based in industrial engineering and management. Um, because industrial engineering has a lot of operations research, and in those days, a lot of operations research was, was queuing theory, with, uh, of the old fashioned kind, which is okay because it was 40 years ago, so it's okay that it looks old fashioned today. Um, and, and so you know, I came to the Technion, I came to Israel, I had an appointment in Tel Aviv in the pure math department, I had an appointment at Weizmann, I think in computer science and here in, in uh, engine, industrial engineering. So basically I was a misfit. Um, mathematics at the Technion at the time did, didn't want probabilists. Because probability was too applied. Right? Um, over the years that changed. Um, so how did I get to this? Yes. And so I got all these tremendous students who were by mistake in the wrong department. They were mathematicians, but somebody had told them, look, you're never going to make a career as a mathematician. Um, go study engineering, right? You have much better job prospects as a, as an engineer. And then they got to the engineering department. They discovered there were some mathematicians there, but since they were in an engineering department, this must be engineering. So the poor guys came and did PhDs or whatever, uh, thinking they were going to become engineers and then graduating and finding that it was really hard to find the job. Um, but they did, they did, they did. And, and they've done very well. And so I, I might, my main achievement I think is, is attracting really good, bright young students and not ruining their careers, but letting them do their thing. Um, and, you know, then sort of piggybacking on what they did. So I got more publications and grants and promotions and stuff like that. So, you know, one hand washes the other. It was fun, but it was fun. Next question. What was the most embarrassing moment? Well, the most embarrassing career. moment. Right. This one's prepared, right? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, offer dared, oh no, sorry, dared to ask me that. And, and I, I couldn't think of an answer. Um, not because there weren't any, but because I don't embarrass easily. And uh, I was discussing this with my wife and it took her all of 15 seconds, right, to come up with the most embarrassing moment. So, so it goes like this, it's 1983. So, so most of you people don't know about 1983, but in 1983, there were no personal computers. There was no wireless. There were not only no smartphones, there were no cell phones. And, and because all this traveling was, you know, the conference and so on was, was a pain. 
um, because you know when you leave home you like to be in contact with the family right people need to know where you are for emergencies so on so what you used to do in those days was leave all your details on paper you, you may know what that is but on paper you know telephone numbers of the conference organizer of the departmental secretary of the hotel you know all the telephone numbers where you were so you could be contacted in an emergency it was 1983 and I, I, I fly over to the US to go to a conference at Cornell, stochastic processes and their applications. I'm 33 years old. So I'm a, you know, a young academic just starting to have some impact, just wanting to get to know the big guys, you know, wanting them to think of me as, you know, something serious and so on. You know, very uncertain, very unsure of myself and so on. And I, I arrive at Cornell, I fly to New York, take a plane to Ithaca, I get into the dorms. I was staying in the dorms at something like one o'clock in the morning. Now, I need to call home. It's one o'clock in the morning. Now, in those days, the way you made a phone call, international phone call, was you had a little calling card, you bought a card from AT&T, and it had a number on it, and so you were call uh, 1-800-AT&T number, that's 10 digits, right? Then you would put in the code of your car, prepaid car, that's another 10 digits. And then you would call the country and you know, that you already wanted to report to, it's another 10 digits, they so got 30 digits. You hope you get them all right, because you know, there's no delete, go back and change one, you know, there's no move the mouse to there and change the one in the middle. You get the, the 30th digit wrong. You go through and you put all 30 in again. It was digital or? Bing, 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 bing. No, it was, uh, it was already digital, I think. It could have been dial, <laughs> I mean. That dial was more, well, it could have even been dial. Anyway, again, it's one o'clock at night and I'm not going to call anybody. Right? I'm, I'm too tired. Um, so I had actually had two people I had to report to. One was my wife, um, and the other was my parents, right, who were in Australia but still. My wife's in Israel, my parents are in Australia. And because the deal was, you know, my, my parents, I was only 33 years old, I was just a little kid. So my parents still worried. All right, so I didn't call. I got up the next morning, I slept in, I didn't call. I didn't have time. Anyway, I go to the conference. I'm, I'm sitting there in the morning session. Uh, it's the session of the invited speakers. You know, uh, you know two, three hundred people are sitting there. Important invited speaker is speaking, and suddenly a secretary walks into the room, and she apologizes to, to the speaker. Uh, she said, "But uh, sorry to interrupt you." She said, "But is there a Professor Adler here?" Right, three hundred people. I'm this. Yes. She said, please come down. You didn't call your mother. <laughs> I promise you, I never forgot again. <laughs> I, I was, you know, when my mother passed, I was 60 years old. I landed somewhere, I called. But that was probably, you know, yeah, the worst of a lot. I don't remember any other embarrassing moments, you know. Um, a serious one, I mean. Yes. But it's uh, well, probably, yeah. Should we pause here and take questions or? Um, sure. Uh, I, I can, uh, I have a couple of questions ready. Um, okay, so um, as we've now heard, uh, like you've lived in Australia, the US, Israel. Um, what's the difference um, like in math cultures in terms of research and professionally? How would you compare these different places? They're different. Um, Australia, remember I haven't been in Australia for 40 years. Australia had a very British system. Um, and so within mathematics, for example, there was an emphasis or a natural emphasis on applied math. Applied math, applied was not a dirty word in Australia. Um, 
And so, you know, pure probabilists learned statistics. Uh, Israel is the math departments are very, very theoretical, typically, um, which is why I've enjoyed being in an engineering department. I, I prefer mathematics, as I said, tied to things. America, which I probably don't have much to tell you about, you all know as well as I do or better. Uh, America, of course, is very, very non-homogeneous, very heterogeneous. You know, one has this image of something which is called America. Um, but, you know, the difference between the Ivy League universities, the Stanfords, the Chicago's, the Harvard's, whatever and state universities is very different, um, which is best, i tell you in a story. I was in Chapel Hill, I was sitting around the tea room, all the graduate students and me, I was a professor, but I always hung around with the graduate students rather than the other professors. They were always so old. Um, and typical math graduate student uh, collection in America, you know, some from India, some from China, some from Russia, some from here, some from there, you know, every, every color of skin, every accent, every, you know, you could possibly want. And they were all complaining about America. Every one of them. Yeah, this was no good, that was no good, this was, you know, the, the standards in American universities are atrocious, the, and I told them, well, you know, I said to them, why don't you go home? <laughs> There's no question that graduate education in America, I think, particularly in the, in the, in the good universities, right, graduate America, education in America, is better than anywhere in the world. Undergraduate education is, is, is interesting, right? A math student in America tends to learn less than a math student in, in Europe or in Israel, but they have a breadth of education that people elsewhere don't get. And that breadth of education, I think is extremely important. You see in graduate schools in America in the first year, typically what I've seen is the foreign students excel and the American students have trouble because the foreign students have a better technical background. But by the time you get towards the end of a PhD, that breadth of education that there is in the American system, um, it somehow pulls, pulls them ahead. Um, so how would I compare them? They're all different. Um, I, as, as you can tell, if I didn't live in Israel, I would live in America. And I think um, I live in Israel, not for professional reasons. Like the universities here are excellent. There's no question they're excellent. But Israel a choice is a choice for, for personal reasons, not for professional reasons. Um, very good, thank you. Um, okay, so then uh, what's the last paper uh, at the intersection of topology and probability that really intrigued you? The last one on the intersection, I don't know. That's an unfair question. Um, right, it's like, you, you know, you line up 10 people and say, it's easy to say who's the tallest. It's hard to say who is the best looking because then you know, Insult all the others. Um, it really intrigued me. I, I don't think I can give an honest answer to that. And, and the reason I can't give an honest answer, oh, sorry, I, I, I can give an honest answer. I don't think I can give an answer. And the reason is that I, I get intrigued by very different things that are not comparable. I, I like papers. You um, don't know. Okay. Not that I have to say this, but I really do like papers that do extremely difficult, you know, calculations that end up with log, 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 and, and, and do very clever calculations and, you know, math type things. I like papers that do really clever applications. I like papers that come up with new algorithms that may be incredibly simple, 
right? Uh, after you've thought of them. And, and so I don't think there, I don't think there is such a thing as the, the paper I've seen recently that is the most intriguing for me. Um, if you ask what is the subject that I find most intriguing now, it's sort of things that, not things that I grew up with, but both uh, learning or neural deep, uh, you know, deep learning neural nets, things like this, partly because of my grandchildren or a grandchild and a son-in-law who worked on this and, and what's happening. And because I'm in an EE department, so there's a lot of that going on. And I think that that's fascinating. Um, and the supply topology stuff, which I think, you know, has really, which I'm not an expert on, but which is really intriguing. Uh, and is exciting. I don't think you were there, but we were just having a short discussion before we came up. One of the things I like about applied topology is the people doing it, that you go to conferences and they're all the age of children and grandchildren. Uh, it, it's a community of young people uh, with ideas. It's a community uh, which is very mixed, both you know, racially and gender, um, and naturally mixed. Uh, it's a very modern community, and, and uh, I, I really enjoy it. I feel incredibly old among you guys, but, uh, but I enjoy it. Next. Okay, yeah, so next. Um, what do you do when you're stuck on a research question and can't seem to make progress? Uh, any strategies or example times where such a strategy has worked? Well, the best strategy, of course, is GS. Um, yeah, to, because they're usually brighter than I am and they, they think differently. Um, I just leave it, you know, you just leave it. Uh, and do something else. Um, you know, I'm no Feynman with 10, you know, deep problems in quantum mechanics wandering around my mind, but, you know, I always have you know, a few things I'm thinking about. Um, and if you get stuck in one, you just leave it for a while. And either you, you wake up in the morning, um, with an idea, um, I have good ideas in the shower, believe it or not. Um, but there, it turns out there's a physiological re reason for that. It's something to do with heating the brain. Um, either you suddenly come up with a solution to something that uh, you've left behind or, or you don't. Sometimes you just have to leave problems. Um, yeah, the thing that Omar was asking about before, about uh, how would you really do topology, real topology, homology for, for Gaussian random fields. I mean, that's, it's something I would love to see. But, yeah. Yeah. Okay, and then, and then we have a very pleasant uh, question to finish. What things do you enjoy in your retirement? Nothing. Um, you Believe it or not, you don't actually have to do anything in retirement. The, the whole... Uh, I read, I, I discovered Netflix. Mm. I'm very disappointed with Netflix because, you know, Lucifer is now finished. Uh, it took away one of the great joys of my life. Uh, we are 71 years old. My wife is the same age, so we spend a lot of time going to doctors. Uh, that's an important part of retirement. Uh, before COVID, I mean, I came in two, three times a week. Um, retirement in Israel is very pleasant, uh, typically, uh, particularly in an, engin in an engineering department. So the engineering departments are much wealthier than math departments. So you can keep your office, you know, and you don't get stuck in four people, you know, in one room or whatever. Um, so I came in, uh, still come in on a regular basis. Um, I listened to lots of talks on things that I did not have time to listen to before. Uh, as I said, uh, learning neural nets and stuff of that kind. 
Um, I had intended to spend a lot of time in sort of Talmudic studies. Um, you know, that had been my dream all my life. Um, but uh, you did for should I, should a few I? weeks now. Well, yeah, I did know. Well, for a couple of it was I could quote Shmuel again. You know, when I, when I told him that this is what I plan to do, Shmuel's comment was, hey, I give you two months or two weeks or whatever. That's roughly what it was. Um, not that I have anything against Tom, Tom of studies, but it appeals to a, it appeals to a, what's the word, a legal mind, not a mathematical mind, I think. Uh, it's just the wrong, I, this wasn't as entertaining as I thought it was going to be. Um, but I, I actually uh, don't do too much. Um, and I enjoy it. I enjoy it. I have time to enjoy life. COVID sort of screwed that up somewhat. But, you know, for all of us, uh, you know, we have plans for travels and things like that being put on the back burner. That's it. Okay. So thank you. So with this, we're going to return to Elkanan. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Omer and Robert. So thank you for the really interesting and engaging interview. You've given us a, a lot to reflect on and think about. And thank you, of course, also to the audience for joining us today and for your thoughtful questions. And we hope to see all of you uh, soon-ish, we got a few months, in February when Shmuel Weinberger will be interviewed by Catherine Turner. Thank you. Thank you.